your input is really important and um, definitely click on that link in the survey. Um, just real quick introduction, I'm the 2020 Arizona Teacher of the Year and so it was really nice to um, connect and uh, have, uh, have this meeting. So I hope to get lots of input today. Uh, I, so all of you know, I'm Amanda Cheremaya. I'm from uh, the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico. Um, I've been in Arizona ever since I was a freshman in 2004 and I never left the state. Um, so <laughs> I uh, love it here and I'm so honored to serve the indigenous communities here in the Southwest. I'm a doc student, doctoral student at the University of Arizona and um, I'm hoping to facilitate this discussion. Um, just so that all of you are aware, I am recording um, this session so that we can share it um, on our social media sites um, as well as other, you know, we can forward it to our colleagues um, so that I want all of you to be aware that we are recording for the intent of using it as an educational resource. Um, we're like the, we're the future historians, we're documenting this so that, you know, 10 years from now when people ask, oh, what was the state of indigenous education? We're like, okay, well, actually we have a little video here that we can uh, share. So. Um, that's a little bit about me. Um, I represent Native SOAR in an advocacy group called VOICE, Voices of Indigenous Concerns in Education. And so we joined with Lynette and um, are here to kind of facilitate this space. Um, but my colleague Felice Tagavan is on here too, and so she's helping to facilitate this as well. Hi everybody, my name is Felice. Uh, as Mandy said, I am also part of Native SOAR and also with the advocacy group VOICE, uh, which stands for Voices of Indigenous Concerns in Education. Um, I am a, currently a graduating master's student and as of yesterday, a newly admitted doctoral student in the U of A's uh, mm -hmm. higher education program. So I'm thrilled about that. Uh, Oh, congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. I'm super excited, and uh, as I've been saying to everybody, uh, I blame Mandy for this. <laughs> I had no intentions of going back to school uh, after I got my bachelor's, but lo and behold, here I am, all these years later, and now I'm going to uh, start more school. So, <laughs> um, anyway, I'm just really grateful that so many of you have joined the conversation. As you know, this is. Uh, vital for our communities and for the students that we serve. So we are super thankful that you're here. And we hope that uh, today not only brings solutions, but also to just a ton of encouragement. Uh, so many of us uh, rely on uh, that community base and that family base that we create in our classrooms and within our respective spaces. And so uh, we hope that this serves as a, a new space of support and a new space of encouragement for you all today. So. Thanks so much. Honey, I want to tell you something. I've been teaching for 33 years. I haven't stopped taking classes yet. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Just get on the road and journey and don't look back. Everything that comes your way, take it. All right. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> Congratulations, though. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, just some real quick logistical stuff. Um, we did create some questions and Lynette will facilitate that just to kind of help with some guiding questions. Um, but some logistical things here, make sure if you want to talk, uh, unmute your mic. Um, and so that's also very important on the left side of the screen. Um, usually in, when we have like classrooms, it's you know, like everybody kind of just jump in and share when you want to. Um, and so we'll see how it goes. Just unmute your mic and just kind of, we're here as an indigenous think tank of sorts um, to talk about this. Um, so on the chat function, um, I'll explain about this survey. So I'm gonna send this again. There is a survey that we created um, where we're gathering information from indigenous folks, uh, people who work with indigenous students. Um, so that we can share this with our partners, whether it be principals or superintendents, your colleagues, families. Um, at our institution at the University of Arizona, what we're finding is, um, is that some of our administrators are asking us, how are indigenous students feeling? How are their families feeling? So we figured it'd be great to collect um, as much data as we can. Um, it's about maybe five to six minutes long. Um, but it asks a lot of um, demographic questions about you as educators, like, do you have access to Wi-Fi? And then it turns it to, do our students have access? Like, 
So it's, I tried to create it in a way where it kind of captures this narrative of our, um, our communities, depending maybe even what state we're in or where we're located. Um, so there's surveys there in there. Uh, please send that along to other people as well. Um, and that'll really help. At the very end, there's an option where you can put your email in. We wouldn't share your email, of course, um, but if you want the results to the survey, we can send that to the email. So that's just the only identifier there at the very end if you would like a copy of the survey. Um, so we're thinking maybe we'll give it about a week and a half and gather as many results as we can and then send that out. Because uh, our it just changes so quickly, as all of you know, our uh, the state of our nation and our communities. So um, we'll probably get that out sooner than later so people can make some informed decisions. Um, but again, to kind of give you an idea how this came about, um, so Lynette had reached out to us via Facebook or uh, social media and was just asking like, hey, any ideas, you know, as you work with indigenous students, how can we, you know, share ideas? Um, and then that, that birthed into this um, Zoom meeting, we're like, hey, let's have a Zoom. And then we're like, wait a minute, we should invite other friends. Um, and so that's how we uh, came up and this came with this platform. So it's amazing within less than 24 hours, we have over 30, 40 people here online, so which is pretty cool. Um, so, all right, so that's some of the logistical stuff. So, Lynette, I'm going to pass it on to you. Um, uh, let's see, Maria. Maria is also a native sword. Can you take notes, Maria? Yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. So, we'll take notes as well as the video recording is going. So, okay, all right, Lynette. Okay, um, thanks for joining us, everybody. So, you know, we really want to understand where all of you are and where your students are. So the first question we have is, what is the state of Indian education in, in your area right now? What is it looking like? How are you reaching out to students? And, you know, we want to hear all perspectives from early childhood all the way through college. And um, if you've gotten any feedback from students, you know, what are they feeling? Um, what are they looking for? So. Um, that's our first question, so go. <laughs> I'd like to begin. I teach seniors basically exclusively. I have several other high school students, but mostly seniors. And um, I have been teaching here since 2010. And so I have, you know, and I grew up in the area and um, we have a great rapport and, um, and trust. So for the first few days, I didn't hear anything from my students. I reached out through email, Facebook, things like that, just doing well checks, just because we don't know what's going on and, and um, we didn't know when we would have school or not and things like that. Plus, what is most important to them, they prom, graduation, uh, bringing back the thunders, things like that, that are important to them, more so than the grammar I teach or the novel I teach. And um, so something that, that has happened because of the students, they have facilitated their own need to be in contact with me. I know a few other teachers as well. And we have been doing these well checks and using it um, because we are educators and because we are here for their benefit, I have followed their lead as well. And they need to know how to navigate tomorrow. They need to know that um, we can still be doing things to fire up our minds. And so just for instance, yesterday, one of the students, not, not me or anyone else, one of the students said, what if we would come up with an emblem, a symbol, a representation just for us for this year. And I do know on a lot of the senior uh, photos, the senior pictures, they have 20, 20 strong on that. But they, they were saying, we need to do something for our own. We need to come up with the color, maybe a ribbon, maybe an emblem. And I could not have assigned a better assignment for them. And so just, to, just to, to wrap this up and say is that they need us, they're reaching out to us, and I have not had a break since school has been let out. And some of the community members think we're not teaching, and they're wanting to see packets out into the community. They want to see that sent out there. However, um, I'm, I'm using their medium, technology, and we are connecting and we're doing well checks and we are going to be doing a zoom 
conversation tomorrow. Uh, just anybody and everybody that is at the school has has decided to join this. But we've been preparing them our whole lives for the next step. The next steps happened. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and, and they're ready for it, but they need us. We've built this trust. We can't let them down now. But I was so proud of them. They've, they came up with their own assignment. I've, that's how intelligent they are. That's how creative they are. They just need me to, to, to cheer them on, give them resources and a platform and a place to check in every day. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And just to Anything clarify else? for everybody, where are you located? I teach at uh, St. Francis Indian School in, Ro in uh, St. Francis, South Dakota. Awesome. I can go next. Um, good morning, all. Good morning. Um, my name is Roxanne uh, Begay James, and I serve our Native American student population within Tucson Unified. Um, one of the things that the district has currently uh, been doing is they've been sending out um, surveys electronically through email and through uh, calls and asking families whether they have access to technology, what type of technology, what uh, grade levels are their children in. One of the things that we are finding as a program is that there is a huge population of our Native students that don't have any access. And so um, that really is and continues to be a huge concern of mine because as the rest of the district moves forward for those families who can and are able to connect uh, uh, with technology, there's gonna be a whole group of our student population that don't have this access. And that's a concern for me. And so um, one of the things that we've been um, also doing is just informing our families, just letting them know if you need a meal, meet the buses, because uh, for our district, we have a bus that's delivering food. So just letting families know, go out there, get a breakfast and a lunch. And then we're also letting them know their, their voices need to be heard, um, even though they may not have received the email or they may not have received the phone call. We're letting them know, we, you need to let them know that you don't have this access um, because it's definitely, um, in Tucson Unified, our Native American student population continue um, to be scoring well below everybody else. And so uh, this causes huge concern for me because it, it's gonna continue to that divide. Um, and so that for me has been challenging. And so um, I know as a staff, we've been reaching out, connecting with families. This is crazy because some of our families didn't even know that schools were closed up till April 10th. And so, you know, that's just like, wow, we didn't, they didn't even know, they didn't even know that these are places where you can get some food. And so I know like, it's easier. A lot of my staff will say, well, we can just easily send a parent link or send like an email, but I'm like, you have to understand not all of our families even have that. So that continues to be like something that really bothers me. I'd like to uh, piggyback off of that because I also am in Tucson. Um, my name is Tia Sosi Begay and I teach at Borton uh, Magnet School Elementary School in Tucson. Um, I'm gonna, the same thing that Roxanne was saying is that we have a lack of devices with my Native American population. Um, I serve about three Native Americans in my, um, in my school because it is in their urban area. Um, and my, my two students who I ha I'm having no contact with right now, um, they either don't have current phone numbers or um, they have a lack of devices. A lot of their devices, for example, if they're going to use a um, if they're going to use a, a phone, um, it's a phone that travels with the parent as opposed to staying at home so they don't have access to remote learning. Right. Um, and then also just returning the phone calls because a lot of times if they're working all day, they won't get home until evening and it's too late for them to really contact mm -hmm. the teachers. Um, I, I, I'm kind of at multiple different levels in Tucson. Um, I also work with a lot of um, new teachers with mentorship and I also um, reach out to some of my other former colleagues. I have a few that um, teach out on the Don Odom Reservation and for them, they're having a lack of, um, they feel like they're kind of not sure where to come in at because they're both serving and um, some some of the 
population is very urban and then other ones are very rural. And so they're trying to find like a mixture. They're having to do some remote learning, but then also create the packets. And so they're kind of doing double learning. Um, and then my understanding is that areas like my own, my own um, community in Kienta has recently just stopped um, serving meals and taking out instructional packets. So on top of ac lack access to food, they're also not getting the instructional packets. So that brings a concern for me just for the entire Kienta community. And then my mom works in Delcon and Delcon is asking the teachers to continue to come into work. And they had a big meeting in the gym for all of the teachers, which just seems to put um, more of our teachers at risk um, to become carriers. And so the, my concern for the teacher aspect of that is that we, we're asking teachers to still come into to schools. Mm -hmm. On another level is that I work with student teachers from the University of Arizona and the College of Education just recently stopped um, all of their, um, they just told us that where they're gonna have very limited contact with the classrooms, they can continue to, to meet, meet and work with us. But my student teacher had told me that some of our, our teachers, which would impact Native American teachers, um, are not fully certified yet, but also they didn't take into full takeover, so they might not have the experience um, that they should have by graduation time. So that kind of puts us at a disadvantage if they're returning to any of our areas. And then also for me, I'm a national board certified candidate for teaching. And I'm impacted because right now I don't have a classroom. And so all of my materials are back in my classroom. I'd have to go back and get them, but I wouldn't be able to utilize the same um, items that I was working on. And so now my certification is kind of at a stall point. And then I also have to take an assessment, which I, the assessment centers are now closed. So that's how it's impacting um, me and my and on our front. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Shirley uh, on the call as well. I think maybe it would be really cool to speak to how it might be impacting uh, your program and uh, just the way that it is uh, uh, affecting this, the student teachers who are going out into the community, if you don't mind. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Valerie Shirley. This is uh, Jeremy Garcia. We're both faculty at the College of Education at the U Arizona, and we co-direct the Indigenous Teacher Education Project. So we currently have 12 teachers who are in schools across the state of Arizona who graduated last May. So they finished their first year of teaching, um, or they're in the process of finishing up their first year of teaching. And then we have uh, about 12 additional teacher candidates in our program. And so, as uh, Tia mentioned earlier, that the teacher candidates have been impacted by um, just completely stopping their field experience. Um, and then there's a difference between field experience and student teaching. And um, field experience is a little less, uh, um, they're, li they're a little less impacted as by, the, uh, by this, um, and, uh, in, in, in comparison to the student teachers. So the student teachers, we have two who are um, not sure how this is going to impact their certification. And because it's um, by the state that they, they, they give the um, expectations and requirements of how many hours they're supposed, and weeks they're supposed to commit to student teaching. So it's up in the air. We still don't know anything just yet about that process and how they're moving forward with, um, within the state. And then the other piece is that our uh, teacher candidates right now, uh, they're, they're all over <laughs> the state of Arizona. So um, they're doing what they can to meet the expectations of their district and their schools in terms of whether or not they're going to move forward with putting packets together or um, just kind of letting things go for the moment. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's yeah. and that yeah that that's that's about it. That's how, what we know so far. We're still working on the current <clears throat> teacher candidates getting access for them to complete their classes online. Can I speak to that? Yeah. So you know, with this whole transition, I think that it's obviously. I think this conversation is involves K through higher education and, and its degree of impact and. I think that, you know, for when this initially 
um, it was, I mean, when we initially made the transition from the university, making the call to go to online, we certainly had to think about the access to resources. And I think a few of you have spoken to that in, in a variety of ways and in, in com complex ways. And, you know, currently we have, as Valerie said, not only our graduates who are currently teaching and giving us updates about their, how they're, they're navigating this as first year teachers, but the other piece is our current, current ITEP cohort where they are, uh, have most of them have returned to their local communities uh, and so we have about two or three right now we're really um, trying to be uh, you know supportive of them because access is a very uh, it's a big issue they're in a, in a rural area uh, as you know that the hope and this is on Navajo so you know that there's both now uh, uh, Navajo uh, mandates as well as Hopi has their mandates for uh, stay-at-home policies or, or, you know, uh, encouraging people to stay at home. So that kind of takes away uh, the options we were looking at. You know, I was in consultation with Northland Pioneer College, for example, to see if they would open, uh, um, give access to these particular students to sit in their vehicles to engage with uh, their courses online. Um, but we know now that uh, that with the new mandates that poses a different kind of challenge and I, and I, you know we I think it's health first and well-being so sometimes I think what what this has pushed us to do is rethink you know what we you know the ways in which we're conceptualizing education and and um, you know there's some great dialogues happening through social media and the analysis now of the intersection of both the ways in which capitalism is driving uh, what we do with education, the way policies, the way, the way Western education has typically been done. Uh, there's now critiques about that and how are we forcing our students to continue to comply with this and, um, you know, and what, what are the inequitable circumstances that, that we can start to see as a result of this. And so to be able to break away from that, I think is important, at least from our lens and the way we're working with our, our students, our ITIP students uh, at the higher education levels. We've been in consultation with also with other teachers who have reached out to uh, ask about, you know, ways in which resources, for example. Um, and so it's kind of interesting there because then we enter dialogues much like this about how much can we say we're okay with just letting things go and, and continuing learning in a different capacity um, and, and valuing that as, as, as knowledge that's being shared uh, we can draw on, for example, indigenous knowledge systems, values, the idea of story. Um, so there's other ways that we can then, I think what this helps us do is be able to privilege that if, if we're intentional. Uh, so that's kind of what I'll add to this. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I was you know, thinking of, about the same thing, and this is actually how it all got started, was thinking about those inequitable circumstances that our, our students are facing. Um, you know, I teach on the Salt River Indian Reservation, and, um, you know, right now we're trying to assess who has access to, um, you know, technology, how many people in the house are sharing, say, like one electronic device. If there's four kids in there, you know, obviously they all have to log in somehow. So, you know, and that's not equitable. So we're really, you know, if you have um, concerns about, you know, that it, we would love to hear it. Also, is there anybody from the um, early childhood? We, we'd love to hear from you too. Hi. My name is Sherilyn Anaya, and I'm actually from Gila River and Laguna, and I'm a doctoral student in teaching and teacher education, but I'm the manager at the, um, for the CCDF program at Salt River Early Education. So that's where I'm at right now. I was at Gila River for about 10 years before that, but um, going off of your point and working with our teachers, what we're noticing too is that with uh, the closure that we're experiencing at Salt River and talking about equity in terms of technology, even our own teachers are having a lot of struggle trying to um, find reliable internet. They're also having to share devices with uh, their children. Um, and I think we make the assumption that just because we're teachers and you know the, the professionals and the leaders that we don't experience these same types of issues, but it's really 
happening um, there in the community that I work. Yeah, today I'm Danielle Lansing and um, I'm a faculty member in early childhood education at Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is a tribal college. And we have an early childhood associate degree program. And we also have a lab school on campus that says 44 families from birth all the way up to age five. And so I can kind of, I'm kind of in both spaces in terms of serving um, early childhood students and then also um, our, our associate degree student, students as well. So with regard to our associate degree students, I think we really tried our hardest last week to quickly assess which students would be able to maintain contact online. And so we're gonna be doing classes. We have a pause week right now, and that's allowing for this transition of, you know, many of our students going home back to their communities, kind of assessing where they're at in terms of how can they log into Brightspace to submit assignments or how can they attend Zoom, whether it's on a smartphone or whether it's with a device that we were able to loan them and, and take home. And that's been really key is being able to have hotspots and devices that we could send home with them. Um, we're a pretty small program. We have um, about 40 students in our program. So that was, um, you know, luckily an investment we had already made through some grant funding previously. And so, so that's a really good thing. But I think that was something that um, we weren't anticipating we would use readily, but I mean, for sure it's working right now. Um, and so right now, I think my main concern is you know, I've converted a lot of my papers, my weekly papers to discussion boards. And also I'm thinking about just having weekly Zoom check-ins, not to say, oh, we have to, you know, implement the lecture, but really as just a check-in in terms of how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, we have a, a grant that we're also running right now and we have some interns who are doing some work and we worked yesterday and we thought about how can we convert and be supportive to one another to students. And so they're going to be doing some um, Zoom uh, workshops for um, transition to online community. And I have one student that's uh, urban. Um, she's here in Albuquerque. And I have another one that's going to be out on the Navajo reservation in a very remote location. And they're both going to talk about how to set up their space for learning. And one is, you know, she has her room, but and the other student is working and, you know, you hear like her nieces and nephews over here and the rest of her family. And she's going to talk about how she talks with her family about how, when she's going to be, you know, involved in her classes and her workspace, and they're going to show two perspectives. So we've been really trying to um, bump that up. We also have a um, Instagram account, which is hashtag SIPI ECE scholars. And they're also really going to, um, bump up some posts and stories um, that focus on that transition that many tribal college students are making towards online learning. So really I'm thinking more about really checking in and seeing, you know, what it, what the capacity is to do this work moving forward because we're still figuring that out. But I'm really happy that our college took the pause week and, you know, we're able to do that. With our early childhood um, center, uh, what our teachers are doing because right now New Mexico has a stay at home order and everything's closed, you know, only essential businesses um, and programs are open. So we're really just confined to our homes right now. And, you know, right now early childhood workers are essential employees. You know, it depends on, you know, where the person is working, but we have some students who are working in, um, private early childhood centers and they are like really just essential to everyone right now in terms of first responders, medical people, and then also, um, you know, uh, people who are stocking grocery stores. So, you know, there's that need in terms of them working and also possibly putting in more hours than they're used to. So I do have some students that are um, still working right now. And um, our Head Start, however, on, on our campus 
is closed and what our teachers are doing is they are doing weekly telephone check-ins with families because that's mainly the way that they can um, check in with them is, is via telephone. And so, you know, I think that it does speak to dis the disparity in terms of, you know, not everyone's able to get online and do their class online because not many more of their students can access that. But I think in terms of connecting with families, that's probably um, our biggest concern. One way that our program is thinking about how can we support um, teachers and how can we support families is thinking about whenever we get to the point that we can support them to a greater extent, we're ordering some um, packets that they can use at home. And so we're collaborating with the teachers right now about what are some things that we can support at home um, that children are interested in and that will um, support their, um, their development as well. So those are some of the ways that we're working really hard to, to maintain contact and support um, our community. So that conversation definitely naturally led into connectivity, which was the next item on our agenda. And it looks like um, if anybody want to chime, wants to chime in about how our student, how are you evaluating connectivity for your students? Um, it would really, I would really love to hear from those teachers who are in uh, more rural communities. Hi everyone. So um, I think for us out in South Dakota, we we're pretty rural. <laughs> um, right now, what our public school is doing is asking parents to allow their children to access their phones. And so our, what our public school has done is using Google Classroom and Facebook, putting up very broad topic types of learning. And so the student, if they can get to internet access, log in using their school email, and then just get on and do those activities. They're ungraded there. Um, and it really, it's just to support kind of what's either happened already in the classroom, um, but nothing really that's graded. There isn't anything graded that's happening, but, they're, the school is really depending on parents' cell phone use. So in our area, um, home internet is very low. The number of families that have internet in their homes is very low. Um, even just having high speed, there's very, very few people in this area that have high speed because the, the services out here don't, don't offer it. Um, and if they do, it's very, like I sit on a, where my, where my home is located, if it were literally like, two feet to the left, I could have access to high-speed internet. But because it's not, I have the slower internet, which just is frustrating for me. <laughs> I can move my house over. So um, that's, that's really all they're, they're doing. Um, we have, so I work with our tribal ed department and my, my conversations are kind of twofold. So on the end of the schools, but then also on the end of tribal, state, and federal, and we have um, a lot of conversation with state and federal going on about expectations for assessments, for grading, for attendance, and um, trying to stay on top of that when information is starting to flow to us and keeping our schools connected to that information. So one of the things that I'm looking at right now are the, is the conversation around um, ungraded, making sure that our schools are giving ungraded assignments because our, our kids can't, don't have access. And if it is, it's very limited. Parents here have to go by data and many of them are utilizing, um, you know, what do they call them? Like commod phones. So the data is very limited. The, the service is really slow. They have to pay for more if they want more. Um, and so I'm sure that becomes an issue in some of our homes where parents are saying, no, you can't use my phone because I need it to call. Um, or parents are, you know, for whatever reason, those, those different things. So, um, and we are, the tribe has put us on stay at home. Um, 
the state not not necessarily i mean they haven't they they've issued out like essential workers and things like that but the tribe has has finally put um the area on stay at home and limited movement um but you know we still we're still able to feed our kids locally our um our public school has utilized the boys and girls club and community um centers in each of the communities where they drop food off and families can go there to pick up food i think they are still dropping off in in the outlying areas um but they're trying to limit access they're trying to uh, follow the social distancing um so the connectivity yeah is, is an issue and i don't think schools have enough devices um and it's you know we don't have great service out here with internet and that's one of the big issues. Although Western Golden West, um, Golden West has said that they're trying to work with our areas to provide free service, and I haven't seen or heard anything more since that initial statement came out. Thank you. I'd like I, um, to add to that, um, if that's okay, for just a moment, because uh, both Rosemary and I are in the same place, and uh, the 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 availability of uh, be, finding ways to connect to our students is so limited and um, she's so true I, I haven't seen three bars on my phone for months and uh, but students do have phones and I as much as I despise them in my classroom I am now embracing them because they do have access to Facebook for some reason, technologically, they keep that one going and uh, maybe not Wi-Fi. And so I am having, um, I'm planning today to set up a place for us, just for my students on Facebook to join where, where we can keep in contact. Um, it's Maslow's right now. Uh, are they safe? Are they fed? Are they warm? Uh, do, do they feel and trust anybody or anything right now? Uh, do they have contact with the people that they need to, the positive people in their lives? And then after that, we can build. But the connectivity is a real, real problem here. And we are in reactive mode. My school system is, is a tribal school and um, it's struggling. We did not go proactive on this at all. Um, I really don't know who did. I, we, we don't have the resources for our students to do a lot of online options way before this. So credit recovery or anything like that um, has been hands-on, face-to-face. Uh, go to the homes, go to the community centers, uh, Saturday school, summer school, whatever it takes. And that has become one of the greatest problems. A second challenge is that the communities are wanting, the people are wanting their students working on work. However, to make it valuable, to make it rather than just busy work, rather than just processing packets, we want it to be valuable for them and not just just something that we're throwing out there. It's, it's not worth their time or ours. But right now I would say um, we have, we're, we're struggling. We are really struggling and we don't know how we're going to get to May. That has been the, the number one mantra amongst the teachers in my school system is how do we get to May without as smoothly as possible while still being able to sleep at night because our students are getting what they need to have to go on to the next step academically so that that our time with them was valuable and if it doesn't happen again until next year our time with them but it was valuable that in native authors that I just didn't leave them hanging um, or whatever the class might be but connectivity is a real problem the students 100% native um, population in our school system um, second poorest place on the planet I think I don't don't quote me on that but we we struggle here and face-to-face -face is how we function and we can't do that and your ideas are great but I will tell you I have learned to embrace Facebook and I have learned to embrace the phone and I have answered my phone every time a student has text or called because in their world, that was a big step, I think. And that's where I am a teacher now, is in common care and then in embedding lessons 
and embedding opportunities to think in our conversations to make sure things are firing and that they, they aren't dalling out. We, we very few have dish or anything like that to occupy their time. So we're struggling here. We have a population. I, I live in a community about 150 people just to let you know how rural this is in this area. But uh, we also have parents that think that teachers are not working. And I have kept in close contact with all of my colleagues in our wing in the humanities department daily and several times throughout the day. And we are working uh, actually more time spent in trying to make things uh, appropriate and um, meaningful we are spending more time than we did when we were, you know, an eight hour clock in time. So we're up against a lot of really negative ideas. We're up against uh, the lack of resources as far as getting word out. And I would have to say our biggest challenge right now is, is that people aren't buying into the, the truth that it's coming. The virus is coming to our area and that what we are doing is extreme but necessary. That has been one of the biggest challenges. My students think it's just a, an old white man's disease. And yet young, young people are, are one of our highest as far as testing positive. So it's, it's a struggle because of what the world is and because we're teachers and because we want to make time valuable and resources have are confining us. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Debbie. Um, I know Tanya wants to share about Baba Kivri, who's very rural in Southern Arizona. Tanya, can you? Hi. Hi, my name's Tanya Sudam. I'm the principal over at Baba Kivri Secondary Campus. Um, so I service uh, seven through 12th grade. Um, and we are fortunate in the fact that the, the Tanatham Nation has been working um, to provide access um, for students to um, have Wi-Fi. Um, and one of the things that they're doing is they've set up uh, Wi-Fi stations in uh, various communities on the nation. And so uh, I think when we check the list for the communities that our students live in, um, all of ours are covered. Um, but what that also means is that they need a device to access the Wi-Fi. And so our district is working to provide, we, in our classrooms, each class has a class set of, of laptops, Chromebooks for students to do um, online work. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll out our technology to, to families um, so that way they can connect wherever in their community that the Wi-Fi is going to be set up. Um, so that's still in the works because our devices are set to only work on campus. Um, now our technology department is scrambling to, to make sure that they can access um, access off campus as well. So um, we, in the initial run, we did do the packets. So um, all of my teachers set up uh, Google Classrooms um, for those students that could access and they could submit their work. So that way they, at least their, their work could be graded and they could be given feedback while teachers work remotely. Um, for those that, we, that don't have access, they had packets. So everything that was in the packet was in the Google Classroom. Um, unfortunately though, we didn't have every family pick up the packet. So we have a lot of them um, that are still uh, either at our district offices across the nation or we have them on campus. And so um, right now my office staff is working to reach out to every single family um, on campus and determine whether or not they need a laptop. Because um, one of the things that technology wanted to do was to send out a survey and that asks parents whether or not they need it. But if you don't have access to the internet, you're not going to be able to respond to the survey, which means we won't know that you need, that your family needs a laptop. Um, and one of the things we did talk about is if we, we have families who have um, kids in, you know, pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. So how can each student get on um, the internet with one device? So depending on family size um, will depend on the amount of laptops that um, students get. So we are, you know, fortunate to be um, in the situation where we have these, you know, the nation's working with us and we're working with the nation to, to make sure our kids have access. Um, the biggest struggle though is, you know, especially for my older kids, um, is the family responsibilities at home now that the little ones are, are home. And so it's how do you allot that time to do your schoolwork when you may also be responsible for the, 
the family members that are in the house. And so, you know, I, I tell tell them to, to do their work, but I also know that they have um, responsibilities at home. Um, and I can't take them from that because, you know, family comes first, um, but it's for my eighth graders and my, and my seniors, then what does this mean for them um, in, in grade wise? So I encourage them to do the work. I do tell them it's going to be graded because I don't want them to feel like it's an option because if they feel like, oh, there's not a grade, um, they're, they're less likely to do it. But we're, you know, I have teachers who are researching all kinds of virtual teaching methods, um, project-based learning that they can do that don't require a whole lot of materials. Um, I had just had a teacher set up a Facebook page um, to one, just provide those videos in that conversation, but also just as a check-in to make sure that they're okay. Um, and, and then on our district, you know, to reach out to communities, our teachers and staff members have been creating videos to put, put on our district um, Facebook page. So kids are being able to see messages from us knowing that, you know, one, do the things to do um, with social distancing, but also that we care. Um, we had one staff member read a story. Um, so we're just trying to figure out, you know, this is a new realm for all of us and it's figuring out um, how, how to provide the work, meaningful work, um, but also kind of just being that support system because right now everybody um, is unsure. You know, I can't answer questions beyond April 10th, at least in the state of Arizona. Um, so what is it going to look like for the rest of the year? Um, but it's, it's, it's a work in progress and I think we're moving in the right direction and just based on some of the things that I'm hearing, you know, everybody's scrambling to, to figure out what to do, what to do um, for our kids. So I don't know if anyone has any questions, but thank you. So I know that a lot of you have mentioned uh, technology through Wi-Fi and setting up hotspots and things like that. But uh, I did see in the chat that Dr. Rhodes posed the question as to whether or not educators have had access to the radio stations. If anyone has uh, considered that platform to uh, share information, share updates, things like that. So I think that's a great question. And I wondered if anyone from the rural communities might be able to speak to that. Um, I can speak to that. Sorry. Um, I actually did a PSA um, for the radio station for it to go out. Um, and we're trying to do more of those. But now there's a, there's a, a different process than getting our messages out. Um, so we're trying to work through those. Um, but that is, that is a, a, an outlet that we use. Uh, just to share one item that was received from Marana Unified School District was a message from their principal, um, was a voicemail and that was left there and I was able to, to lear, hear that. It shared information about working with your students and then also um, the COVID and more information about how to navigate that in a healthy manner. I, I like the idea. I just want to chime in. I think the I, I, I hadn't really thought about that. The radio. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really powerful idea. I, I, I know for I can only speak for Hopi and I think maybe Sheila, Dr. Sheila Nicholas is online as well, but it's a it's an interesting venue to engage dialogue mm -hmm. um, to have callers call in and um, and Hopi Gui is, is the local radio there. And, Several years back, we, uh, myself, uh, Sheila, and uh, uh, faculty member, uh, Professor Angela Gonzalez at ASU, we uh, engaged in almost two months worth of um, discussions around research methodologies and so forth to, to inform the community, to gather their perspectives on the role of research in, uh, in tribal communities. But I just say that as an example that um, it, it does, it did, I felt like it was, it was a great opportunity to be in conversation with the community. Um, and I'm certain maybe the radio stations would, would, would create a space for, for this to happen. So I appreciate the, the, the idea. Yeah, and I also thank Jamie. Am I on? You're on, Gary. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that I know that AZPM has reorganized its daytime programming on two of the stations. But that's sort of, it's not clear to me how the content is being filtered. And I just feel like community colleges have done a really good job in some places of making internet access available uh, to rural communities. Most universities though have television stations and radio stations, in addition to the nations having their own uh, radio stations. and I. I think sometimes uh, we're, we're kind of struggling with this right now. I have a, 
an Upward Bound project and, and the director sending a survey out to the students about all the things that we're all talking about, internet access, high-speed internet access. Um, but I think more homes probably have access to radio than have access even to um, more than one phone. And so I just think sometimes we need to go back to even older technologies than the ones <clears throat> that we, we're generally turning to now. So I would hope that we could all leverage our own institutions to devote some of that programming on our stations and radios for the universities um, to the rural communities and specifically here, obviously, to the Native nations. And then the one other thing I'll say and then, and then be quiet is, uh, someone said earlier about the importance of narrative, and maybe, it, in fact, it was you, Jeremy, the importance of narrative inquiry and narrative storytelling uh, and ways of knowing. And, and I think we often think of curricula as things that we create for other people. I think this, this is an opportunity for us to work with students in various communities, in this case, Native communities, so that they can be developing part of uh, refining their, their thinking skills and writing skills and storytelling skills is to encourage them to, to do storytelling around what they're experiencing. And I think that could be at least as valuable as us trying to create materials for them, more letting them generate from their own lives stories about what they're doing, how they're coping, how they're drawing on the strengths of their communities, their families, their nations, their, their histories. So I'll stop with that, thanks. Now to speak to that point, uh, Gary, we actually uh, made those changes to our curriculum with Native SOAR. Uh, Native SOAR is a multi-generational mentoring program uh, that is also service learning. And so the majority or the bulk of our plans for the semester were completely disrupted. And so what we ended up doing uh, for our first class was one, we canceled it because we thought that we should uh, consider the well-being of our students. Um, First, and so we used last week um, as an opportunity for them to get settled, if, especially for those that had to move off of campus and make other arrangements to go home. Um, and then this past week, um, we used the almost the entire class session as a check-in. And then moving forward, we were just very open with them and described the ways that uh, our syllabus was completely changed. And we asked them to actually help us in co-creating uh, the the rest of the activities for the rest of the semester. And so since half of the grade was based on their um, mentoring uh, component, we asked them to come up with alternative assignments to help us to fill in um, those points because we just recognize that uh, this whole situation has brought us to a place where we need to be completely flexible and where we really need to uh, give them the, the opportunity to um, be part of the educational process, you know, like we've given them voice to uh, help them to uh, help us create solutions, you know, for ourselves. And so I think that because we've always had that sort of familial environment within the classroom, it was very easy sell to get them to join in and uh, buy in to shaping the way that the rest of the semester is going to look like. So we're really looking forward to the ideas that they're going to bring to the table. But even more than that, we're uh, super excited about the creativity that, that we think that this is going to inspire uh, in their hearts, not only for storytelling, but also too for um, being able to shape the way that they tell the story of this semester for themselves uh, for the future too. So. You know, thinking about um, students and, and their families, I think um, it was brought up and, and made a really good point how our parents, you know, balancing the expectations that we're putting on students at home, especially um, like in rural communities, they're look, you know, they have responsibilities of taking care of their, their, their you know, their home um, area, um, helping their elders. And I know um, I'm from originally from to the city. So I know there's there's students out there who come from as far um, <clears throat> as Shanto and, and Kaibato. So, you know, those students have different and unique responsibilities than those um, here 
you know, in, in, in urban Phoenix. So how are we as educators helping our parents balance our expectations as, as educators, but those expectations of our native students? How are we, how are we um, contributing to that balance? Excellent point, aha moment. The same thing we're doing for our students, uh, create a Zoom time, create uh, time on Facebook, uh, however, whatever that we can do so that they can communicate with us, um, whatever means possible. Um, aha moment, thank you. And, and you know, I was thinking about this because, you know, like I said, I'm an educator as well. And, <laughs> I made, you know, packets for all my, all my students and in those packets was two hours of daily work. And I had to take a step back and say, is this a, is this a good expectation? You know, when our families are one, trying to get food boxes and get, get ready to, you know, shelter in place. Two, um, are they caring for other siblings? Three, do they have, you know, devices to log into AZ, you know, RAS Kids or um, all the other links that we put in their packets? So it made me step back as an educator and say, wait a minute, how am I as an educator helping my students balance their home life with the expectations of school? You know, I'm fortunate enough that at Salt River, you know, we're not giving any new teaching. Um, we're not giving any grades. Um, but we want to help students maintain their level of academics. So, but I also, you know, as an educator, don't want to, because a lot of parents are helping their students. And, you know, those parents are also working from home. Um, they might be caring for elders. Um, there's lots of different situations that could happen. So how are we as educators helping families balance those responsibilities? So I know we have about maybe 15 minutes left. Um, and as we're talking, what I'm starting to realize is that we probably need to have another discussion <laughs> probably next week if everybody's down for that. Um, and we'll figure out between Native SOAR, um, Lynette, and Voice a time where we can block out maybe another hour and 15 minutes because it's, it's neat through the chat session where we're finding a bunch of resources that people are posting, which is really helpful. Um, and that'll give us some time to collect these resources maybe, and then we can share it out maybe next week as we, you know, these resources keep coming through. Um, we can share the data that we've collected so far too is also another thing. Um, and so that's kind of uh, what I'm thinking as we're chatting here, uh, because there are other topics like Melody mentioned, working with special ed students and those that even have less access on top of already some access issues um and so that's another dis discussion um but I, so i think as we're talking you, you know that'll probably come down the pipeline soon um about scheduling another meeting next week because this is all really helpful just to hear what's happening um to share there's one component with itep where we're working to develop their language and so now we're at actually able to encourage well the next next week you can bring in your family members you know encouraging that and so when we have our courses when it revolves around the cultural language and traditional components it makes it that much more easier virtually um, to be able to connect with our students and being able to provide that time open to their family to also listen in, engage with us too. It's very much healing. Um, there's laughter, there's engagement, everybody's feeling good. And so maybe that can also add to the balancing within the family home. Um, I did wanna just bring up the question that someone put in the chat. A chat I think it was Amber, but she asked the question, and I think it's a great question, uh, about how we can actually advocate for uh, technology and access. And so while we have some community greats that are here with us, I wondered if any of you had some thoughts to share 
Um, I'm looking to you, Gabby, um, there who's joined us. And I wondered if, you know, if there were maybe uh, ways that we can do it, you know, from a grassroots level or even from, um, again, these uh, out of the box platforms like on radio and things like that. So if anybody has anything to speak to to address that question, I think it's an important one in our closing minutes here. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, one of the things that I've been really thinking about a lot is, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. I've really been struggling um, just on a personal, and like I'm coming um, to this meeting on a cell phone. I've had to order new internet and it's it's been like a huge upheaval in my household, of course, with my kids suddenly home uh, from the university. One is sleeping on the couch right now. My husband is uh, just around the corner, um, also on a teleconference. Um, and so, and, and this is for adults. So it's been really, um, it's, it's been kind of difficult. Um, and so we've been struggling with that just in within our household. Um, and so one of the things that I've, that I often do is I often write about it. I often write op-eds um, and I encourage anybody who um, has the time um, to, to be working on, on op-eds, um, even just talking about, just stating the reality. Um, for me, I've been really feeling disconnected because I'm normally on the nation every single day um, and right now I'm stuck in Tucson. And so I don't know what other people are feeling and I can only, um, I can only ch check in with individual friends and family members and things like that. Um, but I know that the, the internet, um, situation is, is, um, difficult. And, you know, I was really like, really blown away by, by, um, all of the organizing that has been happening within the districts. A lot of people have been asking me uh, a lot of questions about like, how can we get food to elders? And I'm like, the elders are getting their food, you know, from our districts and having to like even explain like that our school district responded in the way that they did, which is, I'm just phenomenal. Like I've been so proud of all of the work that they've done, but people, um, you know, there's been some anti-native racism that's come out um if, especially um hearing what's happening on Navajo Nation um you know like any any of those things I think we we need to consider writing about it writing articles now would be a time people want to hear the story um but I don't know that I'm um a person that's ready for that um just like I said with with my personal uh struggles at home with the internet and uh uh like I said just feeling disconnected um so i don't know i'm kind of struggling with it maybe give me a few more <laughs> give oh, me well, a that's minute. a great Let's start it's good especially for those of us who are in more privileged areas i mean those of us who do have uh access to wi-fi and those of us who do have uh those resources and also to those connections in our personal networks it's a really really good melody maybe would you, would you have anything you'd want to contribute to that one? Or Agnes? I mean, like I said, we had some pretty amazing uh, community leaders out there in the conversation. Thank you, um, Felicia. Um, one thing is talking about writing articles, right up what Gabby was saying, is that Indigenous Stewards is actually taking a look at this time right now for people who work in environment and health. And so I know like Karen Francis Begay is gonna be addressing the connectivity issues and different people are gonna be looking at this time. That way we can memorialize it, look at both the challenges, but also the positive things. There, I mean, that's what's so interesting about this right now. Um, personally, sorry, I should be speaking as an educator, but just personally, it's um, it's challenging to not be, I feel you, Gabby, I'm not at home helping my people. But at the same time, I'm here with family, we're able to be reflective together. Um, I have one with me, one very far away that I can't help. 
And so it's, it's, it's very challenging. I'm very concerned about my students at the Arizona Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Um, these students generally come to Tucson because their home communities don't have translators, don't have braille, don't have the different things needed for basic communication. So what my students even understand about what's happening now and why they can't go back to school and such things, it's um, kind of chaotic. So I think memorializing this, this difficulty, because then there's also great strength in what you two ladies are doing, which is bringing us together online. And there are many different communities that are doing this, which is we're coming together, we're sharing, we're bringing each other up, we're raising each other up um, through storytelling, through strategizing, through policy, um, examination. So it's an interesting duality right now. And I'm glad some of us will be able to write about it and um, think through what this is and what this means to us as Indigenous peoples. So Amanda, what, are, what, how much time do we have left? So we probably have about five minutes left. So um, if I, I put my email on the, the chat here, one last thing I want um, definitely is to leave everybody with is as indigenous educators what are your immediate needs and what are your immediate wants and you can email that to me um, I can share it with Amanda and Alicia so you know because I don't think we have time to even get that question out there and have a discussion. Um, I have one more um, just follow up on on uh, just my comment earlier. Um, I just want to reiterate that nobody needs special permission um, to be able to write an op-ed. Um, so if you're thinking, oh, Karen has this or Gabby has this, uh, Amanda or something like that, please recognize that even if Felice and Amanda and myself were to write about write an article about what's happening right now that those would be three completely different perspectives that could go to three completely different audiences um, and that anytime we're talking about just the reality of, of what we're facing all of that is always beneficial um, we always want to just make sure that we have some type of ask um, even if that's something just um, for instance, the people coming onto the nation to the one grocery store um, to buy all of the toilet paper on the one grocery store on the on the Thonoth Nation, even if the, it was to say, <laughs> please don't go into other communities and get the toilet paper, um, that would be something that would be beneficial and you have an ask and, and nobody needs special permission to write a personal perspective on what's happening, okay? I'd like to add to Gabrielle's comment to encourage people to write op-ed pieces. I'm currently uh, teaching a, um, an online master's class in the Indigenous um, Education Program here at ASU. It's titled Current Issues in American Indian Education. And one of the, the first assignments is for them to write an op-ed piece. So what I shared with them is that they should um, um, a good resource to help them better understand the outline of how to write an op-ed piece is to visit the website, theopedproject.org. So there they provide a really good outline of what, um, the, what are the formats for an op-ed piece. So um, I encourage you, if you're interested in writing one or um, understanding uh, what, what it's like, uh, visit that website. And then maybe Google Amanda Tachini. She's written some excellent op-ed pieces um, in multiple uh, publications. So uh, those are two good resources. Thank you, Colin. You're welcome. So uh, just some last words. Um, I'll go first and then um, Amanda and Felicia, you can wrap it all up. Um, thank you all for joining us today. This came about very quickly. We definitely need to come together again, probably next week, um, give everybody some time to settle in and think about what we've discussed today. But like I said, I put my email up in the chat. Please send me if as an indigenous educator, what your immediate needs and wants are right now. Um, and then, uh, 
thank you all for what you do. Thank you for supporting our, our Indigenous students and our Indigenous families in the way that, in the manner in which you do that. As Arizona Teacher of the Year, I am so proud of everybody here. Um, thank you for joining me. Amanda, Felicia, any last words? Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess that's what I get for throwing folks on the spot, huh? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for rejoicing uh, with me. I was excited to share that news today because it's hot off the presses from the U of A and I'm just super grateful. Like some of my mentors are here in this space. So, uh, you know, thanks for helping me to, to get to this step. But um, we hope that this is actually just the beginning of this conversation. We hope that this space can be um, uh, a, a future opportunity for us to come together and continue to share out, especially as we're learning and especially too, as we're uh, coming into this whole new realm of creativity and, uh, you know, thinking, thinking outside of what we've been, been, been knowing. And so I uh, am super grateful for Dr. Garcia's comment earlier, just about how this really is challenging um, the way that we think about education and the way that capitalism really has impacted uh, the way that we educate our future leaders. And so I love the idea that we're going to be centering uh, indigenous ways of knowing and being and how we can start to uh, think of new ways to uh, reach our students with that. And so I think this is a very exciting time to be in education. I hope everyone is feeling um, built up and encouraged. And again, we just look forward to seeing you all uh, in the weeks to come. So Stay safe out there. We, uh, you know, are thinking about you and praying for you and your students. And uh, yeah, we just, um, we just really wanted you to know that we're here for you. Felicia, so where can they find you on social media? Oh, okay, uh, I shared um, our our tags for Native Soar and Voice, but um, for me personally, it's just Felice Tagban. You know. <laughs> Oh, great. So to finish up um, the survey, please fill that out and send it to your colleagues. Um, hopefully we got about maybe 55 people on this call. So as you report back to your employers or whoever, you'd be like, yes, I was on a call with 55 educators from across um, our country, I guess, and, and just um, kind of sharing in this dialogue. So next week, hopefully we can get even more. We did this within less, less than 24 hours and we got 55 people on here. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so next week we'll come back with more resources um, and maybe we can create something that it's succinct and easy to kind of follow um, and I just kind of some closing thoughts um, one of our professors Dr. Sheila Nicholas we were talking last night about she was thinking about Hopi thinking about smallpox and how that affected our communities and even wrote about the boarding school era and like what was it like that our students felt like when there was a time of great change and now we're all experiencing that. And I, I want to echo the, the sentiments about writing and expressing your thoughts. And especially with our students, express, how do you capture their narratives? Maybe it's like you have them find like one meme that's out there that resonates with them. Like, why does that resonate with them? You know, like that's something pretty interesting that I find kind of comical sometimes. Like one of them that sticks out is like, uh, whoever started the Jumanji game, please end it. <laughs> and so just kind of random things, you know, that kind of can resonate with us during this time, because for future historians, you know, like we're collecting, we're writing our own books. And so I think that's really a neat way to think about that with our students and with um, our education here um, regarding Indian students. Um, so thanks again. Uh, fill out the survey. We'll send out information um, about the dates, uh, the, the time next week that we'll connect um, but at that point, this point, that's it. Um, you can also find me on social media. On Instagram, I go under uh, Teach and Beauty, and Facebook is just Lynette Stant. Or, yeah, Lynette Stant. So um, thank you all for joining us, and we will definitely be following up with everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank Good you. To Stay you. well, everyone. Take care of each other. Definitely. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Should we just stay out for a few seconds? Yeah. Okay.